still got a few people getting logged in. So I want to go ahead and welcome everybody to our webinar update on school reopening for the Afton School District. I'm Travis Brock, superintendent of the school district. Got a few other panelists that have joined me. We've got all of our K-12 principals uh, from Mainier Primary School to Gotcha Intermediate School to Rogers Middle School to Afton High School. They're gonna chat with you a little bit tonight about a few items connected to their buildings. We've also got Erica Chandler and Adam Jasinski with us, and they're gonna help moderate uh, the, uh, the webinar as well as share a little bit of information um, with you. And really tonight is just meant to um, re-engage our parents and our staff around school reopening. We know that there's a lot of things going on this week with um, districts trying to get their plans finalized. And so we really just wanted another opportunity ha having released that information on Monday, having a webinar on Monday for parents, we know that uh, the more information that you feel like you have, it, it just let, at least lets you know that you, you haven't left any stone unturned, you've read it, you've heard it. Um, and so that's really what we're here to do tonight is just provide another layer of information. We've been looking through everything that's been submitted. So I appreciate those who have weighed in um, through the various outlets that we've provided. It's really been valuable as we've tried to shape things up. And likewise, we know uh, we still need to hear from uh, some folks and hopefully we're able to provide some information tonight that will, will help you with some of the decisions you have to make, but also know that it will be greatly appreciated in regards to us firming up things in, in uh, preparation for next week and uh, providing even more information on reopening schools. So um, with that, uh, one of the items that I wanted to share, and I, I believe Erica is gonna share this with you, I do wanna give everybody the most up-to-date information that we have. So as parents have been weighing in on learning options that they think would be right to start the school year or, or for, for the entire school year for their children, we've got that updated information as well as we've been getting a little information from our staff in regards to what do they think the right way to reopen schools might be. So I believe Erica is able to, um, if she's not, I'll make sure she can share that with you. I'll give her permission. Do you need permission, please. <laughs> All right, we've, we've got, got that uh, ready to go now. So I'll turn it over to Erica just to share that updated information. Great, thank you. So this information is accurate as of 4 p.m. today. We have heard from 34.3% um, of our students um, who have submitted their learning options. So we still have um, about almost 66% that still need to submit a learning option. And just as a reminder, the deadline is this Sunday and any family that does not select an option will automatically um, be put into in-person learning and opted out of bus transportation. Uh, here is what it's looking like so far. We have, um, I have it written down because I don't do math in my head very well, 42.5% choosing online or online plus. This number has grown this week. We started at about a third of folks choosing online up to 42.5% and in-person is just under 58%. What that looks like by building is here. So we have Manier, Gotch, Rogers, and the high school. So as kids get older, there's a little more of an appetite to choose online learning, which makes sense. It's a little bit easier as kids get older. Um, but I know at every level, we'll do a great job offering online learning. And then on the flip side, we have also asked our staff what they think is the right decision to start in-person learning for the 2021 school year. So we have, um, just under 38% respond um, so far. The, here's the question we asked, and here's what they're saying. 62% um, think that the right decision is to start in distance learning at home, and 28% fixed blended with just shy of 10% thinking all students in school on site. So that is where we are as of 4 p.m. today. All right, thank you for sharing that update with us. So we just wanted to give folks a little bit of a barometer of, you know, what are some, what are some choices that other folks are making for next school year? And um, so you, you can take that information. One of the things that um, I was asked to maybe provide just a little bit of information about, as Erica mentioned, some of our families are choosing for the online option. So we ask families to kind of make two choices. 
in person or online. And then if you choose online, you become part of what we're calling our virtual academy. And so I know that we haven't necessarily been able to offer that in the school district before. And so that might be just a little bit um, unfamiliar to, to parents. And so even though they think they might want to choose that, they still would like maybe just a little bit more information on what exactly might that mean or what does a virtual academy, what does online learning um, look like? And so I'm going to provide just a little bit of information. I'm going to uh, share my screen and, um, and, and do that with you now just to go through a little bit of information. Um, let's see here. And so before I get to, to the virtual information, I do just want to reiterate, um, most of you on here probably have looked at the information on the learning options that we are offering. And so we really did ask parents to make two decisions. So if they think in-person learning would be the best for their child, we've got a, a range of things that we think might be possible from um, five-day in-person attendance to possibly trying to, to need to limit the number of students that are on site each day, which is the fixed blended. And then lastly, we know that there could be a, a reason to significantly limit the number of individuals that are at school at any one time, which is why we have the 100% distance learning option that might be possible. So this is the range of things that we think could be possible this year, even though we do have a lot of staff and a lot of um, uh, students and parents that would like to get back to school. They'd like to get back to in-person learning. We also know that um, unfortunately the, the conditions in our community are ever evolving and we might need to be flexible while at the same time trying to commit to one of these options for as long as we can. So that's, that's the in-person options. And the one I wanted to speak to just a little bit more are the, the virtual options. And so this certainly does um, involve learning from home. That's the primary um, place where the learning is gonna happen. And so at the same time, we want the uh, kids to still be connected to teachers, Afton teachers. So that's why it's so critical that we ask you to weigh in on what you think your choice for next year might be so that we can arrange our staff um, to get connected to your children and, and do the best that we can next year with this option. And so, I, you know, a lot of things, parents were asking, what exactly does that mean? Uh, and so what, what might the virtual academy look like? And so I, I wanted to start out what, I, what it shouldn't look like. So it shouldn't just look like an entire day, six straight hours of a child staring at a screen. So by all means, we want we are providing children with devices. We want to help with internet access because we think that must be part of this plan. But at the same time, we definitely do not just want a student staring at a screen from um, you know eight to two o'clock or eight to three o'clock. And so what that means is we we have a couple terms that have emerged. And so I'm, I'm going to try to to keep this information um, as as general as possible, but at the same time, help you understand, even though uh, students are learning from home, they still can be connected in real time with their, with their teacher. They can be connected in real time with their peers. Um, and so that's what we call synchronous learning. So there's synchronous and asynchronous, and certainly the virtual academy will have those synchronous opportunities where just like I'm interacting with folks right now in real time, just like you might be having video conferences as part of your work as a parent, um, you're right there in the moment. All of the people on the call are interacting, um, and, and, they're, uh, and, and that's one way that learning can happen. On the other hand, we know it's not always possible for everyone to truly sync up in the same play, same time, um, doing the same thing right at once. And so that's where asynchronous comes in. So it might be something that is assigned for the student to complete and they can, they can complete it whenever it's that time for, for them to do that. It could be a pre-recorded video. Um, it could be an assignment that they have to complete. Uh, sometimes the teacher, the teacher will pre-record that video 
And so after watching it, the student will then perform a specific task. Um, and likewise, teachers may pull in other resources. Teachers may assign readings that, that can be done um, at a different time. So those are the things that we're talking about when we're trying to make that differentiation between synchronous and asynchronous. And here's just another um, display of what the difference between those two things look like. Um, and as you can see, synchronous, think real time, asynchronous, it's not live. Um, you, you know, think uh, the student has the ability to engage in those things and it doesn't, it doesn't depend on the teacher being right there with them at that moment. And so we've looked a little bit at how they're different. So um, I also want you to look at how they're the same. So in the virtual academy um, with online learning, the synchronous and asynchronous um, do have some similarities, meaning that they can be done um, anywhere. So when uh, students have a computer, internet connection, they can engage in both of those things. Um, both of those things involve some level of interaction with their instructor. So even if they're turning in an assignment and their teacher is going to grade it later, there still is that interaction, even if it's not exactly in that moment. But there will be times when the teachers are interacting with students in that moment. So you can see that even though they're definitely different concepts, um, there are some similarities to them. The other thing that I want uh, folks to understand is that we've tried to make this as simple as possible so that there's one place for kids and parents to go for their essential learning. And so the learning management system that we've adopted and will be working in is called Canvas. We want all of that to be in one place. So um, that's our goal this year is to try to make that as streamlined as possible, regardless of what option uh, students choose. But specifically it, uh, with part of the virtual academy, what, we wanna make that as seamless as possible. There's a remind feature within Canvas, so that's how teachers are going to give students updates on what should be happening if there's uh, really important things that are coming up and they want to make sure parents and kids know about them. That's the one feature we're going to commit to using. Now, even though um, we're using a uh, one centralized learning management system, I also want to be clear with parents that within the virtual academy, we are going to form um, cohorts and classrooms that are assigned to teachers. And so you'll be part of a learning community. So there will be a likely a fourth grade um, virtual classroom, depending on how many um, parents and students want to engage in the virtual academy. There could be two. Um, fourth grade classrooms. And so those students will be assigned to a teacher. Um, they will get to interact and they'll get to see what other students are in that class. And so that's gonna be part of the learning as well is, burn, is, is, is uh, building that community um, even within a virtual environment of being able to see other faces, talk with other students, and also uh, really feel like you have that connection to your teacher, your classroom, and your grade level in your building. And so that's why it's critical for us to get this information so that we can start arranging those things to support that learning. Uh, going back to uh, synchronous and asynchronous learning, I wanted to give you just maybe a few more examples of, of synchronous. So certainly um, teachers and students could interact one-on-one. -on -one. Um, that would be one way of interaction. Um, students could interact with each other one-on-one. -on -one. But we also have the ability to generate small groups. So a teacher could just activate a session with a small group of students. And so there could be the teacher and maybe a handful full of students learning synchro synchronously together. It doesn't have to be the whole class. It could be a small group. It could be the whole class. It could be one-on-one. -on -one. So all of those are options in regards to um, getting together live in person. Um, we also want parents to know that certainly academic content will be a part of synchronous learning. Um, but at the same time, we also may use that to take care of social and emotional learning. So sometimes synchronous learning will be used to move forward academic content, but then other times it'll be used to, to really get at that social emotional aspect that we want students to still feel like they have access to, even if they're part of a virtual academy. 
Um, we may have some teachers that are assigned to be part of the virtual academy that come into their classroom to do their teaching. Um, so don't just assume that teachers um, are working from home. Some of them, uh, I think, will want access to resources in their classroom. They may even be in front of their classroom doing some teaching on some um, items that they have at their own disposal. So this is really going to be an interesting dynamic. Um, certainly, there may be instances where a staff member is at home, and that is where they're conducting uh, their lessons with the with the students, but I also want to make sure that that's clear. We we definitely have had staff members uh, express interest of being in their classroom, even if they are assigned or if they have to be part of the virtual academy. Um, switching just a little bit here for a couple slides to asynchronous. Um, as I mentioned, these are things that could be engaged in at any time. So if your child is an early riser and they have um, uh, they have items that they know they need to do independently, they could do those things first thing in the morning before they connect with their teacher. Likewise, they could do those things uh, at some time during the day when they have a scheduled break. Um, once again, asynchronous learning also has academic content as well as social and emotional interactions. So even if you're asynchronous, meaning that you're not literally right with one another, um, there can still be both of those things going on, academic learning and also social and emotional learning. So I want you to know that as well. A lot of times when people think of asynchronous learning, the word playlist comes to mind. So this means that I have a set of things that I know I need to do, or here's a set of things that I want to engage in, and then it's up to me to decide when exactly am I gonna engage in those things. And so here's some examples of what that might look like if you're learning math, um, if you're trying to learn a language, um, also if you're engaging in an elective course. There's a number of things that students can do at the direction of the teacher, and they don't need to be there 100% together for the entire day. So you might hear that word playlist come up whenever you're thinking about how to arrange your day. Likewise, we also want parents to know this isn't isolated um, work, meaning that you know, kids could very well be assigned to do group work. Um, so that, that is a, a fair expectation to do projects, to work in groups, whether that's learning something, whether that's actually completing an assignment. Likewise, there will be interactive forums. So how can students interact with one another, give each other feedback? So those are all gonna be part of the experience as well, even if the whole class isn't right there together, even if the teacher isn't right there with them every step of the way. So that was just meant to build just a little bit of background on what that virtual academy um, might look like because we were getting just some questions and I think some folks were worried that it might just be a student sitting in front of a computer all day with really very little interaction with the teacher or very little interaction with other students. So we wanted to try to make that um, as, as succinct as possible so that you had just a little bit of knowledge on what that might look like. So with that, um, I um, at the end of uh, kind of just before we sign off here, I do have a couple poll questions that I'm going to put out there, but uh, before we get to some of those poll questions, I do believe we're going to transition into hearing a little bit from our principals um, and just giving you a, a little bit more of a, a glimpse or some, some details about what they may have set up um, within the building so that uh, something to you that you can um, imagine the schools, the classrooms might look like for that in-person experience. So with that, Who's going to start us off tonight? I will uh, take it to start, Dr. Brock. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm Christine Powers, the principal at Gotch Intermediate. Uh, the principal from Maine, your Tina Bean, and I are just going to share some information about um, the virtual and on site experiences that your children can expect at the elementary level. So um, in our planning this summer, um, Dr. Bean and I really felt like it was important for us to be consistent K-5 so that the experiences would be very similar um, at the two schools. Um, and so for the most part, what you hear tonight from us, um, as far as the structures and routines, um, they are going to be the same at the two schools. There are a couple of nuances just based on the age of the students and then um, the physical layout of our two buildings is a little bit different. So there are just a couple of little things, but for the most part, um, the experience K-5 in both of those areas will be the same. So being consistent was one thing that we thought was important. Um, the other thing that really drove our planning was the feedback that we received this summer, both from parent, the parent groups and the staff. 
So um, with the on-site experience, uh, we definitely heard people saying that it was important for when kids get back to school that it looks like school, that we make sure that we're still providing those same experiences and opportunities that kids are used to during the day. Um, and it is a typical day for them. And then um, with regard to virtual learning, we definitely heard loud and clear that um, it needed to be more robust, more structured than it was in the spring. Um, there was talk of schedules, accountability, um, and making sure that uh, parents knew exactly what was expected of kids. And so I hope that as we go through these elements um, at the elementary level tonight, that you're able to see and hear evidence of that feedback that you shared with us. So I am um, going to share my screen just to give you a visual of um, the components that we are going to talk about. Okay, and then I'll start off with the first element. So we um, are looking at our essential learning standards. So each grade level team at both Manier and Gotch will collaborate to determine the essential learning outcomes for each of the academic areas, including reading, writing, math, science, social studies, as well as social emotional learning. So students, regardless of which learning option is chosen, will receive instruction in these areas by their assigned teacher. All students will be using the Canvas learning management system throughout the year to access these learning opportunities. So then as we think about our daily classroom schedule, Teachers will be providing students and families with a daily schedule that will include all the subject areas and social emotional learning time. We think it's really important for our kids to have class meetings and lunch and recess will also be built into those schedules. So this um, schedule will be similar for all learning options. So when we think about on site or flix, fixed blended um, the schedule. Um, this schedule will um, not only include those instructional times, but it will also build in um, additional movement breaks and hygiene routines. So they'll have time to go to the restroom, use, um, do some hand washing frequently, and workstation sanitizing. Um, thinking about the virtual and distance uh, class schedule, the schedule will mirror the on-site schedule. Academic learning blocks will include asynchronous and synchronous learning, like Dr. Brock was explaining, and will focus on those essential standards. So content will be delivered through Canvas and um, it will be available prior to the start of the day. Um, we will make sure we have those class meetings um, synchronous. So we think that's important for kids every day to have that time to check in with their class and their, build that classroom community. So during the assigned learning blocks, teachers will use the combination of whole group, small group, individual, um, both synchronous and, in, syn synchronous and asynchronous instruction and assessment. And then thinking about that virtual plus option, we'll have opportunities for on-site instruction or opportunities not offered through the virtual schedule. So that could be the gifted program, special school district, Title I, ELL. Um, thinking about our classroom setup, we have a few pictures of some classrooms that we have um, social distanced the, the tables. So we are able to provide um, um, seating that is distanced based on the classroom size and number of students. So in a fixed blended classroom, students will have an individual desk or table that is um, three to six feet apart from others. And students will be keeping all of their belongings at their assigned spot. Um, so arrival and dismissal times will be staggered in order to keep student cohorts together and limit the degree of cohort mixing. Cohorts of students will have assigned doors for entrance and exit of the building. Breakfast and lunch, those will be eaten in the classroom. We're collaborating with chart rules to provide meal options that can be served in the classroom. And we'll make sure that students use hand sanitizer or wash their hands before and after eating. So for recess, uh, recess breaks will still be in the student's daily schedule. We actually have that in the virtual schedule as well. Um, Classroom cohorts will be assigned a designated area on the playground. Um, so we are going to be blocking off different areas so that when classes go out, they know um, where their play area is. So if you think about the blacktop 
at Manier and then the blacktop in the field at Gotch, we will um, spread classes out uh, for, their, for their breaks. Uh, special subject classes, that will still be in the schedule for the on-site option. So the classes will go to either art, music, library, makerspace, or PE. Um, the difference from the typical schedule though is that those, they will have that same special for the entire week instead of rotating every day. Um, this also helps the special subject teachers out so that they're not seeing as many classes throughout the week. That would be, it will only be six classes that they would be seeing instead of 29 or 30. Um, the special will take place in the classroom or we also will designate some outdoor space um, for the special subject teachers to take um, their classes. And then the PE classes can be held in the gymnasium or outside. We both have, um, both schools have a pretty good size gyms that uh, they would be able, to, we would be able to use those. Um, and so just like the classroom teachers, the special subject teachers will be delivering um, instruction through Canvas. So this allows the virtual um, students to be able to access that material as well. Um, our intervention, so Title I, uh, Special School District, ELL, and Gifted, students um, on, on site will still receive that small group um, support. Uh, no matter which learning option you choose, the SSD services will be um, provided. Uh, students will leave their classroom to go to these small groups um, for instruction. The classrooms will be sanitized in between groups and students will have their own individual supplies that they can bring to those small groups. Um, if we are on site or in the fixed blended model, um, the virtual plus students can receive these services inside the building. Uh, we plan to follow up with any families that selected Virtual Plus just to confirm which classes that they wanted to have their students on site for. And then student supplies. Typically um, at both schools, we send a pretty lengthy supply list to, uh, to parents to purchase items over the summer or for the start of school. And so we are re really paring that list down. Um, and each school will only ask families just to bring a couple of items. So a pencil box, a water bottle, headphones, and then for students in grades two through five, either a wire or a wireless mouse. And then each of the schools will provide uh, students with all of the other supplies and there'll be individual supplies. Students won't share supplies in the classroom. So those are the items that um, we have done some planning on both for the on-site and uh, virtual options for the elementary students. All right. Uh, thanks, Dr. Powers and Dr. Bean. And uh, next up, I think uh, Dr. Myers and Dr. Buck are going to provide some similar information and insight at the secondary level. So I'll turn it over to them to, to start. Hi, so if I could just say ditto to everything the elementary said, that would be wonderful because um, clearly we've done a lot of work together and when you hear what Dr. Buck and I have to say about what's going to happen at the secondary, really the differences that you're going to see are a lot centered around just age appropriateness for the students that we have at hand. So what Dr. Buck and I heard uh, resoundingly through all of the interactions we had with staff students, parents, other stakeholders was that we needed to have as our number one focus, the health and safety of our students. And as a number two, we needed to ensure that our students were moving forward academically and that we were maintaining that growth that the students need to find success at their next level. So I'm gonna share a slide um, very similar to the one you've just seen, I think. Do I have permission? There we go. Okay, so when we talk about our daily schedules at the secondary level, um, one of the things that we wanna make sure that you know is exactly like they were saying for the uh, younger students. We are gonna be focused on uh, making sure that the students have the instructional time that they needed for all of the academic areas, their social emotional learning is going to be addressed. We're gonna be talking about those hygiene routines with their hand washing, using of sanitizers for their hands, sanitizing the workstations that students will be at, especially when they've moved from one workstation to another. 
um, and in general making sure that they're assigned to that classroom and we're keeping it as safe as possible for that academic learning. At the secondary level, the students will have one classroom, and this is a difference because it's not normally been like this. They will have one classroom and all of the teachers that they see during that day will rotate to them. So at the high school level, I know a lot of my high school parents um, and students are chomping at the bit to uh, kind of get a grasp of how in the world can this possibly work with the way our schedule normally is. We will be addressing we will have five different periods for lack of a better term. We will have an academic advisory followed by a elective course, then an academic advisory where all students um, would meet with a, the, their advisor would check all of their progress in all seven of their courses at that point in time and have a check-in that's more like in that true advisory position to support the students and be able to contact parents if there's anything that's not going the way that it needs to be. And they would also have lunch during that period of time, followed by another elective and then another academic period. So during those academic advisory periods, all of their core course materials will be supported during that time. Think of flipped classroom where you see the lesson is sent home and then the teacher spends their time with them helping them problem solve, create, critically think, all of those sorts of pieces will be happening in that classroom. So core courses are handled during the academic advisory period. Two electives are actually taught in the classroom and of course that's during the blend, fixed blended and the in-person. And then students in that situation will also be able to take one online elective at the high school level. All right, for Rogers Middle School, uh, we are still looking uh, to organize our students into teams. So whether a student chooses to be a part of the virtual academy or to do the in-person learning, they'll still be assigned to a team and part of that team is Rogers Middle School. Uh, so in the virtual academy, they might uh, participate in both synchronous and asynchronous learning, again, through Canvas, just like we talked about that at the K-5 level. Uh, if they're in the in-person option, then uh, what we're building right now is a schedule that kind of has our teams uh, isolated to different parts of the building, more like pods. Uh, and similar to at the high school, the students will be in, in one room for the day, but their teachers will rotate, their core teachers and elective teachers will rotate through them. Um, so we're kind of splitting the day in half with lunch in the middle. Uh, in the morning, each, uh, each team will have a couple rotations with core teachers and an elective period. And then again in the afternoon, a couple rotations with core teachers and an elective period. Uh, one of the things that uh, is a little more elementary than secondary for our schedule is uh, we are treating our electives much more like specials. So uh, this, rather than uh, limiting which students can be in which room, this kind of gives every student an opportunity to engage in, in all of the electives that are, that are optional for the year. Uh, kind of a, a bit more of uh, opportunities for them. One of the other big things is we're, we're very fortunate at Rogers to have a beautiful campus and some great outdoor spaces uh, and some large spaces within the building, the cafeteria, the gym, the library. So our goal is to take advantage of these as, as often as possible to allow students to move from that one room. So while we say they're assigned to the room, we're also working to build a schedule where we can move students from those rooms, get them chances to move uh, and to be in different spaces for learning. Um, so th those are the big differences maybe the, between K-5 and, and the high school with Rogers. We're kind of right in the middle. And so we get kind of a little bit of both worlds for there. Um, I think Dr. Myers is actually going to, to show a picture of what some of the rooms look like at the high school right now. Uh, our goal at uh, Rogers is to get to a very similar state. Uh, I can tell you that Rogers doesn't look like that right now because we have quite a bit of construction going on. Uh, most of our floors have been retiled uh, and are getting their final coats of wax. Uh, most of our furniture was moved to uh, tractor trailers on the back lot and it's just starting to filter back into the building. Uh, fresh coats of paint, the, the gym looks fantastic. And of course our new front entrance is kind of coming into focus if you drive by. You can kind of see it looks a lot like the front entrance for Major and Gotch. And, and so that's kind of taking shape in the middle of all this planning. And, and our goal is to kind of get to what you're seeing here with our, our spacing of six feet uh, should we be in that fixed blended model. Uh, for, for the next thing on our uh, topics here is the essential standards. So just like K-5, again, we've done so much planning together. Uh, we're really asking our teachers to kind of focus on what are those essentials? What are the things that students absolutely need to know, whether it's academically or what are those social emotional skills that, that they also need to develop? And, and how can we focus on those so that regardless of whether we're in person five days, uh, fixed blended, uh, distance learning, or even virtual students, how do we make sure that they're all getting those uh, to the same degree in preparing them for, for being able to move forward. Uh, classroom setup, I think Dr. Myers already kind of showed a little bit of that. Uh, Dr. Myers, was there anything you wanted to add about classroom setup for the high school? 
Um, just that we also would utilize uh, the large spaces that we have available with the auditorium, the gyms, um, and outside spaces as often as we can. Uh, we too are getting a matching beautiful entry to the high school that's coming together right now. Yeah. Uh, also similar to, uh, to Mainer and Gotch, uh, we're working on staggered arrival and dismissal schedules, so kind of within the window of the school day. Uh, and some of that might depend, might, might not be finalized until we have a better idea of how many students select virtual versus in person. And that'll kind of allow us to set, at least at Rogers, what do our teams look like and what's the best way to utilize the entrances we have and kind of stagger those arrival and dismissal times uh, to get students in the building safely, get them to their space, and then also to get them out of, out of the building as safely as possible. Dr. Myers, if you wanted to touch on anything with arrival and dismissal or if not, head on to uh, breakfast and lunch. Sure. At the high school, um, when you think about all of the exterior entrances that we have to the building, that's how we would uh, handle our dismissal and arrival. So uh, again, just like Dr. Buck was saying, we will have some staggered times. We won't be able to give those exact times until we know who is coming in person and who has opted for the virtual plan. Um, but that will be something that your entrance will not be the normal entrance and your exit will not be the normal exit that we have done. We'll provide maps. We'll let you know exactly how they're going, but your student will enter in the nearest exterior door to their pod that they will they will stay in for that that keeping of those isolated um, so all my parents that line up really really early at the high school to come get your kiddos we're going to ask that we kind of separate that out a little bit so we don't congregate there but I'll send you plenty of information on that to get you started when we get closer to that time Okay, so lunch and breakfast, how is that going to work? That's the, um, one of the hot topics I've had, at least with the teenagers. I don't know if you guys have that at home, but food is a high priority for them. Um, basically, we are working with Chartwells to ensure that we can have lunches provided in the classroom for the students. So consider a sort of grab and go as the students are entering for their breakfast. We will have uh, sack breakfasts that are, are available for the kiddos to grab. And then at lunchtime, we will actually bring the lunches to the classroom with the students there. Um, obviously, we're going to do our best to have them six feet apart at that moment in time. We're going to do hand washing and all of the um, pieces that keep kiddos safe. And hopefully, we'll have good weather where we can have them outside for a significant number of those moments as well. Elective classes. Um, when we look at the high school, there will be two elective classes that students will take in person and then they have the option for the third elective class that will allow students to continue to take seven courses each semester as we have in the past. Um, but under some different um, styles. So in that elective course that is online, it was important to us after our experience in the spring to make sure that all students and teachers were um, ready for that experience, even if they do come in in person, just in case we have to be in a virtual setting. So we've been practicing on how that's gonna go and making sure that that accountability and that commitment to the learning standards, those essential standards has continued in that light. But we will also have the two in person that are available for those that opt to be here for the learning. Uh, you heard earlier when I talked about uh, our schedule at uh, the middle school level that electives will be much more of a kind of a specials approach. Uh, the, one, the one area that might be a little different than that is for those students that select a year-long music course. We're still working on planning for that and still looking at a lot of the research and guidance around what that might look like and, and so maybe large uh, instrumental music gatherings or vocal music gatherings might look different. They might be smaller, but we're, our goal is to still to have those uh, to whatever degree we can. Uh, the next thing on the, on the list is uh, interventions, whether that be uh, support in math or reading, special school district support, language support or gifted support. Our goal is still to be able to provide all of those services for all of our students that, that, uh, that require those or that uh, you know, fit the requirements to, to receive those students, whether they're in person or virtual still uh, the goal is to provide those services to the best degree we can. Uh, student supplies, uh, just like uh, Mainer and Gotch, we're definitely limiting what we're asking students to bring. Um, we won't be using lockers at the high school or at the middle school, uh, and so students will be carrying whatever supplies we ask them to bring with them, so we're going to limit that uh, to just a handful of things. Uh, obviously, their Chromebook uh, and headphones to go with that. Uh, a water bottle, since our water fountains will be turned off, just the bottle fillers will be available. Uh, and then uh, mask, and the district is also providing a mask for every student and staff member. So, uh, you know, I know that uh, washing those and keeping those fresh is important, but uh, the district is going to provide one. And so then maybe just additional to support that. Um, 
and the last thing is sports clubs and activities. And I know this is going to be obviously a much bigger deal for the high school. So I'll let Dr. Myers kind of hit, hit on most of this. But our goal, at least at Rogers, is to still have as many after school clubs and activities as possible. Some of those we might need to do virtually. Um, but as, as rates allow, we might be able to get some things together in person. And we'll just kind of have to see how that goes. Dr. Myers. Yeah, so at the high school, obviously our goal is to have all of the extracurriculars as available as possible as well, but we will be following with the medical um, advice that is being given to the district as well as what the county is saying. So currently we are in a phase one opportunity. Um, lots and lots of complicated little rules and, um, and areas that we have to look at when we do that, but essentially the students are were able to work out nine students and one coach in a pod outside socially distanced and it's physical training. There is no equipment that's going with that. So we have kept at that phase one all the way through um, to now what's going into our dead period. So if you um, are familiar with high school athletics, there's a dead period right before we start the official practices. Um, that's a week that we take off. That's an additional time that I know I'm finding a lot of comfort in having so that we can look at how the numbers are progressing in our area before we come back to our official workouts um, but we will be trying to have all of the athletics to the best of our ability as long as it is safe for our students um, and then of course our career extracurriculars any and all of those extracurriculars, we are looking at ways to deploy those both electronically and in person. It could be a part of that uh, virtual plus if we're in the right situation for that to work safely. Um, but even things as far as our mentoring for our ninth graders that are coming up, we do have and have just recently gotten a completely online version of what we're working through. And so we will be training our upperclassmen to mentor the new students. And that, will, that information will be coming out shortly as well. We want to make sure we got past all of these before we started giving grade specific information out. But you will be seeing um, all of the electives that will have a central sign up, will have different activities to allow students to see what electives are available and we'll continue to offer those to the best of our ability. So I know Dr. Buck did hit on this, but I want to make sure I go back and touch on one thing about one of our electives. PE is a course that students will not be changing clothes for. We will not be using locker rooms. We will not be using lockers, not for a PE, nor for in the hallways for just the regular lockers for students. We are asking that students bring absolutely only what is critical to bring to school on any given day. And so we won't be using those resources. They will have to store them right at their desk, whatever they do bring in. And again, very minimal. and. I don't think the high school has had a supply list before. Um, so that's something new for everyone, but we are sticking to what Dr. Buck mentioned before. All right, thank you, Dr. Myers and Dr. Buck for that information. Um, so once again, uh, that was just meant to give you just a little bit of a glimpse into some of the work that's going on, some of the schedules that are being arranged. And I think I mentioned this on the last webinar. Um, certainly all those things that you just heard, um, I don't know that any of us would imagine those are the things we'd be designing to, to start school. And so all, all those assumptions are uh, based upon, we feel that um, COVID is gonna be in our community, unfortunately, on the first day of school. And unfortunately, it could very well be in our community throughout the school year. And so a lot of those routines and things that we're engineering uh, comes out of health and safety uh, being that top priority, while also keeping learning moving forward. So how do we do both of those things, um, knowing that we just simply can't revert to um, just doing what we've always done and kind of leaving it to chance that, uh, that things will just work out okay. And so I know um, th those things are um, quite a bit different. We've tried to put that in the roadmap to reopening documents so that if you read that, you start getting a little bit of understanding that things will be arranged differently, but certainly hopefully some of the help, the information tonight was helpful to maybe visualize that a little bit more and just understand what exactly that might look like. Still a ton of work to do between now and the first day of school, but at the same time, little by little, we are trying to to give you that information. Um, one of the things that I did want to do real quick before we transition to a little bit of question and answer, I know Erica and Adam have been doing some, some moderating through the chat. I think we are going to do just a little bit of Q&A, but before we do that, um, we, we, um, we got up to 525 people on the webinar, and so um, I'm beginning to 
you know, to, to, to feel pretty good about the engagement. So I appreciate that. And, and we're staying pretty high. I did want to launch one of our polls just to see kind of uh, what kind of representation we have with our, our parents tonight. So um, I'm going to launch that now. You guys can let us know what schools uh, your children are in. And I'll show you the results once it looks like uh, most people have um, have law, uh, have registered their uh, their response. So you'll stick with me for just a couple minutes while we're getting organized for the Q and A session, and I'll watching the results come in fast and furious while uh, while you guys are are waiting. Looks like we're up to about sixty percent of people responding, so we're getting there. You have kids in multiple buildings. You can choose number of different number of different answers there. We'll see which which school was represented the most here in just a minute uh, on on our webinar. I'll cut it off in about ten seconds here. See where see where we're at. All right, so this is this is kind of what the results look like. We had about um, of the 500 participants, we had about 75 percent weigh in. It looks like Afton High School is uh, is on tonight. So uh, way to go, Afton High School, for engaging and I appreciate you uh, logging in as well as all of our others. And um, go ahead and whoops. Take that down. All right, Erica, you want to do just a little bit of Q and A? We kind of want to make sure we wrap up in a, in a, in about an hour's time. So uh, got about maybe 13 minutes left here for just a little bit of questions, and then I do have one more poll um, uh, uh, to kind of close us out. And uh, so what, Erica? What can we maybe uh, answer? That's a, a frequently asked question. I think the most burning question is. Um, so if a family starts the school year by choosing in-person learning, but then changes their minds, can students opt into online or vice versa? So we're at July 26th, this Sunday is the deadline to make a choice. Is there flexibility after that? You know, I think we do have flexibility leading up to kind of that first day. Um, but like I said, um, I, I would I would characterize that by the, the if it's a, it, the, the less, we can have with changing is certainly the better for us. And, and at the same time, I think it's, it's really critical to have some flexibility leading up to the first day of school. But, and then once we get school underway, that's really when we're gonna ask folks to, to kind of work with us make a commitment to making it work and so that's the that's what I would say is that we do have to cut things off just to make sure who do we get responses from? Who did we not? And so we do have to have that initial cutoff, but I certainly do understand we're a month away from school and things can change. So as much as possible, we'll want to work with parents to see whether we can make those changes up to the first day. And I would encourage folks to really have those critical conversations this week, but then also as soon as you can have that, that discussion you know, within your family about what you think is gonna be the right fit. Um, certainly the, the sooner we can know that, the better, but I think there's some flexibility leading up to that first day. So don't, don't let that um, too much anxiety set in um, in regards to if um, Sunday comes and goes and something comes up that you feel like is critical to change that decision. I think we'll try to be as flexible as possible. Once we get school underway, that's really when, when we need to work together to, to make those options work. Thank you. Um, principals, we'll see who wants to answer this one. Uh, what will happen if a student won't keep their face mask on in school? That's a great question. <laughs> I think that the most important thing that we have to do as a school is to set the climate for that classroom and to set the climate for our building. And so it starts not with the student refusing to wear the mask, but it starts with us teaching that we are all interconnected and we all depend on each other. Um, we will use restorative practices to talk to students who are struggling with wearing them appropriately um, on why we have to have that done that way and how it's important to all the kiddos and the teacher that's 
with them and that sort of thing. So we will work very hard on that, that avenue of teaching children, not just about the mask, but about the sanitizing of your hand and how we sneeze appropriately when we're in a classroom, um, how we, what's the difference between washing our hands and using hand sanitizer and when do we do that? When do we sterilize our, our workspaces? So um, I kind of gave that answer in a previous webinar and the follow-up was, all right, Myers, what's up when they really refuse to do it? And so the bottom line is we are also trained in discipline. <laughs> so we will definitely work with students, contact parents if we have a, a, a refusal. Um, but really what we're anticipating is that students who, um, they do not want to wear a mask, they will not wear a mask, and their families are supportive of that are going to opt for that virtual um, because we do have to keep all of our kids safe. And that is one of the pieces that we've put in place as an assurance to parents is that we'll be taking that action and moving forward with that. Now, on the flip side of that, um, we, we do expect that we are going to need to give kids and adults breaks from the masks. They are um, you know, especially if it's a hot and humid day. We were at lunch today and it was extremely humid and hot outside. And it did make the mask a very um, difficult thing to hand, uh, to just handle. So we need to make sure that we also, by the design of the day in the class, have times that we go to spaces that allow kids to take those off for a little bit. So we're gonna be very conscious of that. And I, I think that the one thing <laughs> that should make everyone feel comfortable is that we are all in the same boat together. So we're all adult and child learning how to wear them appropriately, learning how to handle having them on for an extreme amount of time. Um, and so it, it'll be a learning curve, but mo all of my experience in the year I've been at Afton has been that every time a kid feels like they belong, they do the right thing and they do a very supportive thing. They might need a little bit of coaching because they're still kids but that we can get through that. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Brock, I, I would like you to touch on um, uh, this next question, although I will let um, our, everyone watching know there is a great detail to this answer on our website. If you go into the Roadmap to Reopening section and then the FAQ under Health and Wellness, there's a lot there. But Dr. Brock, what do you anticipate would happen if there is a positive COVID case in one of our schools? Would the entire class need to quarantine with the entire school? How do we anticipate that happening? Yeah, so certainly we're going to work with our health department and they are going to be in contact, you know, not only with that positive case, but then that's what their contact tracers do. Um, they will be eliciting information and certainly if the school can help with that, we're going to so that they can reach out and get um, in contact with students or staff who may have been considered a close contact. And so that typically means if you are within six feet, for 15 minutes or more, you fit that um, description of possibly a close contact. And one of the reasons we're trying to arrange things the way that we are is so that the school could try to help provide that information in a, in a very succinct way. So we, we do know where the students were sitting. We do know where they were. We know what cohort of kids they were. So that way it streamlines those families, those students, those staff members getting contacted. And so um, we will also rely on them after they've gotten all of that information from the individuals to help render that decision. And so certainly in the absence of, um, let's just say that the health department gets very overloaded and they aren't able to do that, we do have the expertise in-house to provide guidance on and, and, and understand how to contact Trace. So if we need to, we can give parents and kids guidance on what we think the right thing to do is. Our first hope is going to be that we work through our health department. The biggest tip I've gotten, um, and this is just from hearing other programs um, that have started. So there have been some summer programs that have started both in school and then some non-school based. Um, masks are really a key factor that I'm hearing are why uh, folks are being um, referred to quarantine um, if they've been exposed or not. So if you can answer that had a mask on the whole time, um, there was, and, and, and really we were safe, even though we were in close contact, a lot of times you're being advised that you don't necessarily 
need to quarantine. And so that's just um, what I'm hearing from, I guess you could say, uh, from stories from the field that, uh, that folks are passing along to me. And so is there a possibility that an entire class would need a quarantine? Absolutely. So that, that is absolutely a possibility that that could happen. But like I said, the, the contact tracers are gonna go through their matrix of who was wearing a mask, where were you sitting, who was the closest to you, what other interactions did you have were um you know and um and, and all of those things are going to be considered and like i said we really try we'll try to rely on our health professionals to be the ultimate um i, I guess you would say advice to our our kids our parents and our staff on whether they should quarantine or not and certainly as a school district we want to err on the side of caution we want to be supportive of that direction that they get and we don't want anyone to feel like they're feeling pressured to go against um, the, the orders uh, or, or the recommendations of the health department. At the same time, if it's, if it's safe to, to be back in our learning space, we don't wanna preclude somebody that um, it's been rendered, they are able to come back and get back to learning. So let's say a student is exposed to someone who is COVID positive either at school or even possibly at home. Uh, can they still access learning virtually from home even though they're an in-person student? You know, that, that is one of the biggest reasons why we did make a decision to go with one learning management system. We don't want parents to have to then be moved over to this system. We don't want them to have to then be moved over um, to a different group. And so as much as possible, I, I think that we're going into this school year with, I guess, the reality that regardless of whether you may choose the virtual academy, there may be a time when we're all distance learners or online learners. And so we wanted the staff and the students and the parents to be able to have that option of, hey, if, if I'm in person, um, I know where my learning assignments are, um, even though I may not be accessing Canvas while I'm at school, I may be interacting with the teacher, it's still there. But if for some reason I'm absent, it could just be a normal absence. I'm absent because I just have a normal doctor's appointment. There's nothing, nothing COVID related. I just am not, not coming to school today. You still would have access to information that's been posted by the teacher. But then certainly if a student needs to stay home for an extended period of time, that's, that's why we tried to make that commitment to one notification system one place where that learning is posted. And even, even if we have in-person teachers and in-person students, a lot of the things that you heard about synchronous and asynchronous, we're gonna very much encourage our staff members that they are conducting, they are producing their own videos. They're producing uh, things that they can then upload so that if for some reason um, a, a kid needs to access that later, maybe you were in class, so you were there and heard it, firsthand, um, you, but maybe you want to go back and look at it. There's a number of things that we're going to encourage our staff members to do because we do know that, you know, absences are, are any year absences are tough to keep up with, but we just know we're going to have to go that extra mile because absences are going to be even more um, important to be able to try to navigate around um, this, uh, this school year. So that is our goal to keep that kid, keep that teacher connected and still work within that one uh, learning management system. Great, thank you. Uh, I wanna be respectful of time, but let it, people know if you need to jump at 7.30, we are still recording and we'll provide this recording um, hopefully quickly tomorrow as soon as it is transcribed and captioned. Uh, but I wanna ask a couple more questions because they are important and are being asked quite a bit. So elementary principals, will um, students have the teacher that they were assigned at the end of last school year on fly up day? So um, after all the parents have made their selection, uh, we are going to need to poll the students that um, are going to be uh, virtual. And as Dr. Brock said, we'll be assigning them a teacher. That might be one class per grade level, it could be two. So it really just depends on how many people choose the virtual option. And then the students that are, um, the parents that, for the parents that have chosen the on-site option, we will need to balance out those classes just to be prepared for 
the possibility of going to the fixed blended option where we would um, have half of the students coming a couple days and half coming the other couple of days. So Dr. Bean and I plan on doing some of that work next week after um, we look at how parents have um, selected their options. So there is a possibility, a slight possibility that we might have to move a few students around just to make sure that the classes are balanced. But that I don't anticipate that being widespread. I think it'll just be a, a couple of students and we will be communicating that um, to parents so that they know who their child's teacher will be to start the school year. Great, thank you. Dr. Buck and Dr. Myers, uh, how many teachers do you anticipate a student having at your school? Is it reduced this year or is it, would it be the same? They're just not going from class to class. Yeah, I think for Rogers, the, the number of teachers will be very close to the same. It may, maybe instead of having uh, seven teachers or eight teachers over the course of a week, it might be spread over a longer period of time. So they may not see as many elective teachers uh, in a day as they did previously. Uh, but I still see them getting just as many, if not more opportunities actually. So they may actually see a few more teachers over the course of a quarter or a semester. Thank you. Dr. Myers, is that similar? Same at the high school. They will get all seven of their courses deployed by a, an Afton teacher that will be providing the instruction. Again, I, I'm, we're looking at the flipped classroom model. So they'll be creating the videos, um, sending out the content through Canvas, but in their cohort, they may have someone else that's tutoring them in that content as well. So they could actually have more adults that they could be um, working with through the blend of virtual and in person. Great, thank you. Uh, another question that's been asked um, on the, for virtual students, but this could also apply if um, in-person learning needs to go to 100% distance. How will students have access to their school counselors? I think um, one of the things that we know we have to do in any situation, uh, but especially if, um, you know, if we're in a situation where everybody's 100% distance learning, we, we've got to have a bit more definitive um, schedule and structure to how resources are accessed. Um, and so, and, and, and whether it's a virtual schedule or 100% online, if pretty much everyone is remote learning, we need to have that set schedule every day. There will be a little flexibility in there. So it doesn't mean no breaks, no time to, to, to choose what you're doing, but we do anticipate teachers and kids trying to keep a very set schedule in regards to this is when certain things will happen. And I think extending that to some of our other staff members who aren't specifically classroom teachers. So how will we make sure that kids know when their counselors are accessible? Is that an appointment system? Um, you know, th th things of that nature to where, um, and, and obviously those counselors will be taking initiative to, to do outreach. And so that's something that's also going to go on even, you know, even if we're working remotely is that they will be doing outreach. If there's kids we haven't heard from, if there's services that need to get coordinated, they certainly will be, um, We'll be doing that, but I also, um, you know, believe that there is probably just a little more, a little more structure that probably needs to be in place for a number of our support staff, so that that um, maybe a parent or a kid can request or access some level of contact with them. Um, likewise, we know there are counselors, art teachers too, during certain parts of the day. So just like we're, uh, our, our staff members are gonna be recording some lessons so that if you're absent, um, no matter where you are, you can access them, you can see their face, hear their voice. I, I would envision counselors doing the same thing. If there's a lesson that they're going to um, deploy on um, a social and emotional topic, how can we capture that so that um, all of our students have access to that, um, as well as our counselors maybe providing some things live where, where all students can be a part of whatever lesson they're, um, they're uh, delivering that day. So I think that's definitely gonna be different this school year than what we experienced last year is just a much more coordinated uh, and, and robust way of being able to make sure the kids are still seeing, uh, feeling like they do have access to all of the individuals that, that they normally have access to if they're, if they're in person. Great, thank you. Dr. Bean, um, I can remember as a main year parent a minute ago, how exciting it was to get school supplies. Do you anticipate students needing backpacks this year? So with their Chromebook that they'll receive this year, they're going to get a bag to carry it in. And we will be asking for our kids to carry that Chromebook home every night to charge it. So I think that with that Chromebook bag, they will be fine. That will all be the only thing they'll need to bring to school. So right. I don't anticipate them needing a backpack. 
Thank you. Thumbs up other principals if that's true for your school. Okay, very good. Um, Adam, surprise, you weren't anticipating answering questions tonight, but we have gotten a couple questions about will students receive Chromebooks prior to the first day of school? That, do you anticipate that? Yes, they will. Um, not sure when yet, but it will be before the first day of school. Great. And how about um, homes that don't have reliable internet access? Is there anything we can do to help them? Yes, we actually have partnerships with both AT&T and Charter for the fall um, to provide low-cost internet to families, and we'll be expanding the amount of hotspots we have available should we need those. Um, in the spring, we wanted to do that, but we couldn't even buy hotspots if we wanted to. They were sold out literally across the country. So we, we have those, those problems fixed now. All right, thank you. So I have saved probably the most asked question for the last, and Dr. Brock, this one's for you. Uh, when do you anticipate a decision on what in-person will look like at the start of the year? And how often do you think we could transition between on-site fixed blended and distance learning? Is there a set time for those or could it just be one week, one or the other? There we go. Um, did you guys get that? Oh, okay. <laughs> I was on mute, uh, but but uh, I gave I gave you the answer. It's just you didn't hear it. Uh, so um, so we believe uh, we should be able to have that answer early next week. Um, we we definitely are targeting next week. Um, you know, we we know that that's on everybody's minds, and like I said, we're trying to get as much data from what parents are selecting as possible to keep that as um, one of our factors that we're making decisions. So, so definitely early next week, we should be able to have that announcement as far as what does that in-person learning look like. Um, and our, our goal is to always make sure that folks know that we wanna stick with that for, in my mind, at least a quarter. So if in a perfect world, if we're designating an increment of time that we can stick with, I'd like for that to be at least a quarter. Um, and I don't want to transition back and forth. Um, as we know, if conditions change, so let's say we're in the middle of a fixed blended um, schedule, things are going great, and all of a sudden it's just very clear that that is no, we need to transition to something else. We'll do that, and then we'll have to evaluate where is the, the logical checkpoint to, to maybe look at restarting another learning option. So if we kind of get caught in the middle of a quarter, or if we get caught close to a semester, then we'll have to evaluate, um, you know, what, where do we reset that next level at? But the goal is to try to give parents that definitive answer so that they can plan for it and they know that I'm planning for this amount of time and not having to you know, toggle back and forth um, between different schedules. So that's that's the, that's going to be the goal is to really think about this hard, and that's why we didn't um, you know come out and give a definitive answer on Monday. I, I feel like we we really wanted to take the temperature of um, what is going on around us. Um, we know conditions are changing. We want to we want to kind of see are we in in the same choice option as other districts, that's important to know. Do you have good company with what you're um, planning on doing? And it looks like we are in pretty good company as far as where we're thinking about starting the year. Um, the, that is one thing that um, I was gonna ask before we jump off here. So if you're one of the 421 people that are still with us, um, I am going to ask for your, for, um, you know, put you in my shoes. So if you were in my shoes, if you were the decision maker, um, how would you? start school. And so I'm going to put our last poll up here. And, and this really means if you were in charge of deciding for the whole district. So it's not just what you want for your own child. You know, you may have chose something for your child already. You know, what do you think the right thing to do for the district is? So I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and launch that and see if we can get any, get any insight into um, what I can, uh, what we can do. Um, and so in launching this poll, one of the things that I had mentioned on Monday, because this was some feedback we were getting, is that um, folks wanted to know, are you, are you really even considering everyone coming back five days? And it just doesn't seem like that's something that right now any district is, or not very many districts are really entertaining, and I'm not sure that that's going to work for Afton. And so we really are looking at that fixed blended or 100% distance. Um, those are the things that we think are 
are where we're at. That's what a lot of districts are deploying. So that's why when I put up the, the poll here, that's really um, kind of where we're, where we're working at is how, what, what do you think might be the best? So I'm gonna launch that poll and I'm gonna let um, everyone play superintendent for about a minute. So if you were in my shoes, what, uh, what would you do? It's like we're getting close to about everybody weighing in. We've got about 80% of our folks have uh, weighed in. We'll keep it, keep it active for another 20 seconds. And maybe 10 more seconds. I know we got some folks uh, getting close to 90%. So we got about 367 folks that have responded. I'm gonna go ahead and shut it off. We've been at about a minute. And I'm gonna share the results. Anybody care to guess what it is? I'll give you one clue. They do this before uh, the beginning of every sports contest. That's where we're at. Got a 50-50 shot of, of, of getting it right. Um, so that's um, that's good advice. Um, uh, so I'm not sure what I gleaned from that, but, uh, but that's where everyone's at. And so um, I, I wanted to do that um, just because I, I thought that could be where, uh, where folks are right now. And um, I, I think that uh, maybe if we took that poll a, a week from now. Maybe it would look different. Maybe it would look the same. So um, the one thing I will kind of close us out with is just a couple things I wanted to let folks know is certainly thank you for joining us tonight. I know we've gone just a little bit longer, but wanted to get to some of your questions. And so when it comes to making those decisions, um, we definitely are, um, are absolutely happy to do that work. And, and we know that parents count on us to do a lot of uh, the things that we've been doing over the summer. Um, I will just kind of encapsulate what we're, what we're up against. This, this is a new, uh, a new era where um, we're not only called on to be um, experts in education, um, but I, we are now dabbling in um, what we know about um, health and, and rates and infection and quarantine and isolation. And so um, I say that because a lot of times um, when I'm talking with folks, they, they think that I get proprietary information from the federal government, the state government, or, or, or someone else. Or is there, are they feeding me information to help make these decisions? Is there a matrix that we can look at as superintendents or that our staff members can look at to make the right reopening decision? And, and although we're given guidelines, and although we can look and see what's going on in the community, we see various things that are being enacted. Uh, so in St. Louis County, we have a mask order. We see that um, restrictions are being placed on activities. As Dr. Myers mentioned, we're in phase one. We see other things that are being limited like large gatherings. So it's being discouraged for those things to happen. And so while we can look at all of those things that are going on, um, there, there really is no playbook for schools on how to reopen. There, there is nothing that says if your community spread looks like this, these are the learning options you should be considering. Um, we have come to those conclusions um, collectively. So superintendents working together, we've come to, 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 to somewhat as much consensus as we can of what makes sense, but at the same time, we really are just trying to do the best we can. And that's why in Afton, we highly value your voice is because we know that at the end of the day, it's gonna be our decision. So it, it's our decision. It's not um, the state's decision. It's not the county's decision. It's not anybody's decision other than those of us who've got the most skin in the game. And that's the folks on this webinar. It's the panelists. Um, it's it's the, the kids that we're ready to see again. All of us have um, skin in the game. And, and this, this is our district. So we're gonna to have to make the decision. 
And whatever the decision is, um, we just simply need to support one another because there is no magic formula that's, that's going to be given to us. So there's, there's, no, there's no decision that's going to be handed down to us. So we're going to have to do the best we can. Um, you know, once again, health, safety, equity, and learning will, will guide us as we make our decisions. And um, we ask for your support. So whatever, wherever we land next week, just know that there was a lot of deliberation, a lot of intentionality, a lot of consideration. And if I, if, if, if I knew exactly what the right answer was, I'd have told you a month ago. I would have told you two months ago. Um, and I think that's what is so, um, that's what's so um, 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 interesting about this time is that we all know that, uh, that things can change and that's pretty uncomfortable. But, um, you know, I, I think that from what I've seen in the comments, what I've seen in the questions, I, I know everybody has a vested interest to do the right thing. We're all trying to do the right thing. We're all trying to do what we think is best for our staff and our, and our, and our students. So if we can keep that in mind, I think we'll be in good shape, whatever, whatever's thrown at us. And um, once again, appreciate our panelists. So thank you to our principals. Uh, thanks to Adam and Erica for helping moderate. And unless there's anything else, I'm gonna sign off and Thanks everyone once again for, uh, for joining us.